Right. Well, it's good to be here. You're going to have to have a little grace for me. I have to sit tonight because my back went out this morning. That even means more like I've been in this mission now 17 years. So I think it's just getting older or something. So uh, I, have to, I, said, I have to sit. I can't make it through with, uh, with standing today. But um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, the first time I came here was 12 years ago in uh, 2012 when we came here uh, with circuit riders um, on our second year that we ever ran circuit riders. They hosted us here in Harpenden at the Oval, and man, do we have some great stories from that season. But uh, I'm honored to be back. I was here, I think, two a year and a half ago with my husband, and I was speaking in a school, but now I'm back. So in them inviting me, they actually gave me an assignment so that they didn't say, Amy, you can speak on whatever you want. They said, Amy, we want you to speak on this, which <laughs> I love too. So the, but it's a little bit of a tricky subject because um, they asked me to speak on the apostolic and the prophetic and how they work together, okay? But I'll tell you a little bit why that's being asked of me, is uh, for a number of years now, well, actually since the whole time I've been in YOM, but really the last couple years, uh, our, one of our founders, our, uh, our, one of our This was a mission. Joy was the prophetic voice into our mission. She worked alongside Lauren. And Lauren Cunningham obviously passing away one year ago uh, this week. And they were truly an example, and many others, but what the apostolic with Lauren and Joy with the prophetic really birthed this movement that we're all in right now. And of course, there's many other people that were involved in that too. But Joy was a, teaching, a teacher as well, um, because in this mission, and I'm going to visiting, which is awesome, so you get to be a part of it, but I'm going to speak on that, that place uh, as a YOM family, and our beginnings as a movement really started around the apostolic and the prophetic working together in why we're all here today, and it has gone on, on and on. So when Joy passed away, which I had the great honor of spending her last few years around her in California, I lived in California at the time, and so I really did get to be around her some, which was an honor, and then really spent the last years uh, in Kona, the last six, really around Lauren as well. And so my heart was to understand not our prophetic history, but to understand our history in the prophetic. And like, what were those days like? And so I started asking a lot of questions and compiling information and stories and all of that to really go, how do we move forward into the future as a mission with still carrying this DNA that we have of the foundations and building on those foundations with the prophetic and the apostolic really working together? Now, at that same time that that happens, there's a great shaking that's been pay taking place in the body of Christ. And I know that I'm not in America right now. I am American. And there's been even more, I feel like, in America than anywhere I've seen. Maybe that's just because where I'm at. But it seems in these last few years, there's been a great shaking that's taken place that I truly believe is the sovereignty of the Lord to shake our prophetic movement, to bring it into alignment and to the pure flow of what God wants to do. And I'm so thankful to be a part of Youth with a Mission because by the very grace of God, there's been a purity that stayed in this mission this whole time um, that I'm just so thankful that God hijacked my life 12 years ago and put me in this missions movement. Um, just with the inheritance and the rich history that we have as a mission, I'm just so thankful to be a YWAMer. So the biblical teaching uh, models, you know, the biblical teaching on the models that the apostolic and the, and the prophetic is that they were designed to work together. It really was God's design that these two gifts work together. And I'm going to explain them as, as I go. And when I say the apostolic and the prophetic or apostles and prophets, you know, there's a difference between someone that we would say is an apostle versus someone that walks in an apostolic anointing or versus someone that's a prophet that walks in a prophetic anointing. But for the sake of this room and all these teachings, I'm going to very much talk about the prophetic, if you will, not so much everyone's a prophet, but the prophetic and the apostolic in some different ways. And this doesn't just apply to a YOM base, but church leaders, pastors, you know, ministry, all of that. But a lot of the same principles apply as to if somebody was a prophet or a prophetic. Those are the principles that I want to go after today. 
Okay? So Ephesians 4, verse 11 and 12. And he himself gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for edifying of the body of Christ. So I'm not going to get into this deep dive on the fivefold ministry, but truly when people are called to those places, their number one job is to equip the saints. That's what I believe. Who are the saints? Most of them are the saints. So anytime someone really leads in that way, their job is, is to be the equipper of the saints more than any other, other part of what they do. So in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, and it says, And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. So I want to start with even what Colin just said. But we believe that every Christian hears God's voice. And we call it the priesthood of all believers. It's our foundation even as a mission. And there's obviously many, many ministries that, are, that believe that too. It's that his sheep hear his voice. And not that long ago, I was speaking on hearing God's voice or something like that, and I did a little bit of a deeper dive on sheep. And it was so offensive. And he says, my sheep, and he compares us to sheep sometimes because they're not that intelligent. And the, the trouble that sheep get into is baffling. Like, really, God, of all the things you could have said that we are like, but you call us sheep. I mean, they're cute, but they can drown in the rain. Like... Because they look up at it, like really strange things. And I'm like, yikes. So, but it's a little bit relieving because that means it's not that hard. Because sheep do a lot of dumb things. They get themselves in trouble. So do we. But the one thing they can do is they hear the voice of the shepherd. And it says the voice of a stranger they won't follow, which is wild. But why? It's because they've been with the shepherd. So I believe that he doesn't make it hard to hear his voice, that he actually is a God who speaks, and he wants us to hear his voice more than we even want to. And I actually do believe that people that are called in the prophetic don't have greater access to God's voice than others. I believe it has to do with their assignment and what God's called them to do, their ministry. But he doesn't say, oh, these guys that are called to helps over here, these guys that are evangelists, these guys that are teachers, they're not going to hear God as well as those that are called in the prophetic. I don't believe that that's true. But I believe that those that are in the prophetic, they just hear differently and for purposes of what God wants to do. He speaks to them because of the calling and assignment on their life, just like he speaks to others because of the calling and assignment on their life. So even though in the structure that they put here, and I've done a lot of study of like, why does it say first apostles and then prophets? And there's lots of reasons around that. But I do believe that it's purposeful because of the way that those two gifts work together to build foundations and to equip the saints for what God wants to do with Jesus being the chief cornerstone. So often the time when we're birthing movements and ministries and bases and we're casting vision and all of these things is that the apostolic and the prophetic are the ones that receive the new revelation and insight from the Lord for what's supposed to happen next. That doesn't make them better. It just makes them, that's their assignment. And so those two giftings often hear the most from the Lord about building, about how we're meant to cast the vision and move it forward. In Ephesians 2.12, it says, Having been built on the foundation of the apostle and the prophet, Christ himself, the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple of the Lord. So we can have a lot of prophetic exhortation. We have exhorters, intercessors, prophetic people, and it doesn't carry the same authority that someone that God's truly anointed as a prophet, but I do believe very much like intercessors carry a strong prophetic anointing to hear the Lord and to pray and for the assignments that they're on, the lives, the assignments on their lives. So not every church and not every ministry has someone in those giftings. Not a, and I don't believe that every church or ministry or place is supposed to have, ev have every one of those giftings. I go to bases and churches and ministries all the time that I would say, yeah, there's not a prophet here. There's prophetic people, but there's not anyone. Or this, this ministry is definitely not being led by an apostolic leader. It's definitely being led by a pastor or an evangelist or whatever. And so you have those dynamics to say, was that bad? No, it just means that you have to be aware of what you have and what you don't have. 
But I'm in a place that I actually do believe that there's apostolic anointing here in, in Harpenden. And I definitely believe that there's prophetically anointed people here in this place. So they're asking me to speak on this subject, which is kind of wild because that means there's hunger here to grow in this. I, mean, I could speak on a lot of different things, and I do. But I'm like, well, if they're asking me this, it's a good sign to me about what, what is wanted, what is being cultivated, and what is God saying. I'm like, awesome. This gets me excited because what might God be doing in this next season here in this location? So most apostolic leaders I know are actually very prophetic, okay? A lot of them, though, lead from what we would call a prophetic unction or intuition, so they have a sense from God and a faith to take risks and walk that out. So this dynamic of us working together can be an interesting because a lot of times apostolic or strong apostolic leaders don't really need people. At least they don't feel like they do. <laughs> Why? Because they're very usually quite gifted and they can accomplish a lot on their own. Just because that that's true doesn't mean that that's right. So they often hear God's voice very well. And God encounters them in many ways, and they don't necessarily, they don't, they don't need a prophet to hear for them. So all of us hear God's voice. So I want to say nobody like, hey, I need a prophet to hear God for me because I don't hear very well. That's not right. So it's like I work with very strong apostolic people. <laughs> I don't hear God for them. They hear God for themselves. But I do hear God and come alongside them for what he might want to say and do. So God designed that the apostles and the prophets, the prophetic and the and apostolic, they work together. And we have these scriptures about the apostolic and we have scriptures about the prophetic. But there's nowhere that gives us this roadmap and guide. Oh, okay, they're meant to work together and here's how you do it. It just says these things, but then it doesn't say how. So it's kind of left us in a lot of ways to figure it out through other scriptures, of course, but also through time and experience and fruit that's been, that's fruit that has come from it to kind of like, it takes a lot sometimes to go, well, how do we piece this together? And I by no means am an expert. Please hear me. I'm not being asked this because I have figured it out. I am still figuring it out and will probably be walking that out for the rest of my life. So what we have to do is we try to walk it out the best that we can and see what bears fruit. Guys, that's my litmus test for everything. Well, does it bear fruit? And sometimes I don't know until I look backwards. Well, we did all of these things. What fruit came from that? What could have we done better? What can we do better in the future? What have we learned? All of that. So over my many years and many movements that I've been a part of birthing and many mistakes that I've made and many experiences that I've had, I've put together a guide of what I have found works and things that don't. So I'm going to talk to you about those things that we've learned. And I have, you know, I have 25 years of experience. That's how much I have in this. Uh, I've, and I'm from 25 years now, I've always been connected to a strong apostolic leader. Since I was pretty young, before I even was in YOM, I was a part of birthing several different movements before even coming to YOM and had a very strong apostolic leader in my life that was more of a spiritual father to me too, so I was quite a bit younger, but I've always worked in that way, and they just happened to all be uh, men, as strong apostolic men. I also know, very, I know some strong apostolic women, and I have relationship with them, and I've worked with them, but never in the capacity that I've worked with like on a daily basis. So in all of this, I, I've actually worked with multiple generations of apostolic men, and the primary, obviously, Lauren Cunningham, if you're part of YWAM, is the most apostolic man I've ever known in my life. I mean, he birthed a five million persons missions movement, and he took on ending Bible poverty, and he went to every nation on the earth, and he sent young people. I mean, so I have never met, and I don't know if I'll ever meet a person more visionary than Lauren. And so it was one of my great honors and super humbling to work alongside him in these last years before he passed away. And then I also work... Uh, with Andy Bird, who a lot of you would know. Obviously, he, we've been a part of several movements as well. He's the exact same age as me. He uh, is redheaded just like me. Um, we're both from Alaska, and we are opposite in every single way, okay? <laughs> Very opposite in every way, outside of being redheaded and from Alaska. And I'm a couple months older than him, so I like to tell him that. <laughs> so... I've worked with Andy for 18 years now, 17 years. 
No, 18. 18 years I've worked with Andy, and he's a very strong apostolic leader that's in my peer group. And then I also had someone that was just a bit older than me in my younger years of working with them as well. So I, I'm very careful not to over-label or put things into a box because God's always still teaching me, and he's always still surprising me, and I'm always learning things. So I never like to go, this is exactly how it is. It's not exactly how it is. It's like things are constantly changing, and we're learning from them. And I think there tends to be more understanding around the prophetic than there actually is around the apostolic. We use that word in a lot of ways, and people are like, what exactly is that? And I hear that there are others coming after me next week uh, and weeks after that are going to explain this a little bit better than I will even from that place of the apostolic, or I'm coming at it more from the place of the prophetic. But the word apostle means sent one. That's what it actually means. But from my experience and understanding, this is what I've come to understand the apostolic to mean. These are the characteristics of, ap- of the apostolic or apostle or apostolic anointing. They are pioneers. Everyone I've ever worked with, they're pioneers. They take new territory. They continually ask the question of how can we take new kingdom territory? They can't not think that way. It's like they're very wired this way from the Lord. They are strategists. And they're willing to take major risks. Every apostolic leader I've worked with and know, they take crazy risks that make me so uncomfortable every time. They have a tolerance for really big risk where I would like stress out and pass out or something. You know what I mean? Like I can't, hand, I'm not made to carry that level like they are. They have a tolerance that a lot of us that are not gifted in that way or called in that way do not have. Do you, working alongside Lauren was so stressful <laughs> because no vision was big enough. And we would just think he would say some crazy thing. And I'm on the leadership team. And so then we would have to be like, we all look around and we go, like, that's impossible. We've learned our lesson over and over again. It wasn't impossible with God. But in our minds, we could not comprehend how. And we're like, you just created so much more work for us. Like, he cast the vision and he expected us to go do it. And we're like, like, I cannot tell you how many times that happened. Where we're like, no. Like, you almost, like, dreaded him coming in the room because he was about to cast vision again. And we were all going to have to sign up. And if he literally asked us, are you in? He would go around the room. Amy? And he sometimes would be a contract. I'm not joking. Covenants. We're all taking on ending Bible poverty, whether you are called to it or not. That is what we are doing. Here's the covenant. Sign it if you want to stay on the team. Like, that's kind of how it was sometimes, just being real. So we would be like, we just are trying to do the last thing. So it would stress us out in many ways. And even being around Andy and others, you're like, huh? So it's uncomfortable. But guess what? If you're in YWAM, you're in a movement, and they move, and you're never going to settle. It's not how we operate. Like, if we're not, if we don't keep going after this, if we don't look at the apostolic that we have, that we built this thing on, and that doesn't continue to happen now that Lawrence passed, we will, we will cease to be a movement. So that means to me, why am I talking about this? Because he's raising up apostolic leaders all over the mission. All right. So they have a gift of high faith. Lauren Cunningham had a gift of faith. And even navigating the world of the send, and a lot of you, I'm being very personal and honest with you, but like, I know Andy really well. The thought of him running a conference would have been disturbing a while ago. Like, the guy hates everything big, like, he hates too strong of a word. He, what, he would rather go hike into the Himalayas and never be heard of again. Like, that actually is how he's wired. So, he had never ran a conference before we did the first send gathering. Not, not even a little bit. There's nothing he was like, but... God spoke. He had faith to see another missions movement coming out of Europe and coming out of uh, America and these places that when we gather, God would do something and and the whole, you know, the vision. So they often lead by their spiritual intuition. You're like, how did you know that? They're like, I don't know. I just knew it. Like, I knew that I knew. And I watched it over and over again. They have an anointing on their life to bring multiplication and acceleration of things. It's like when those kinds of, when that apostolic anointing gets on something, it just accelerates. It often multiplies. They have a gift and anointing to communicate vision in a way that inspires and motivates people to respond to the vision. If you've ever heard some of these guys, you're like, I, w- I came in here 
determined to not sign up for whatever was going to be said. Like, mm -mm. and you, they start speaking, and you're like, oh, I'm in, yes! And you're like, shoes are in the air, and everything is happening. And then you go home and go, uh-oh, what happened to me? I got caught up in the moment. Yeah, you came under that apostolic anointing that's on their life, and that's exactly what it's there for to do. It's not a manipulation. It's actually an anointing. And they activate people in vision. They often have an anointing to gather people around that vision, and they create movements. They birth movements. The apostolic makes other apostolic people sent ones. Guess what? We're all sent ones. So there's a place of what is that primary job? They equip the saints. They equip people to be sent ones. They are meant to cover and often father and mother a movement that they birth and lead. They create foundations for others to build on. And the kingdom builder, they're kingdom builders more than they're ministry builders. And one thing about that I've seen, at least in our movement, is they birth things and they keep going. Like give them away to other people to run and do. Um, but they build, they build a kingdom more than like Lauren Cunningham did not build Lauren Cunningham Ministries. He called it Youth with a Mission. Think about that for a minute. You have one of the greatest apostles on the planet, and he never named one thing after himself his whole life. And the greatest dishonor we could do is call something Lauren Cunningham. He called it the most uncool name that there is, youth, with a mission. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, and it's cool. It's cool. It's our name. But it's not like the global takeover of the mission. You know, like, nothing cool like that. It was just youth with a mission. I think Andy, the send. And then I'm a help, I'm the co-founder of Fire and Fragrance. Talk about a dumb name we had. And God wouldn't let us change it. Okay. <laughs> Anytime God calls people to work together, there's always, it always requires unity. And when there's unity, incredible things happen. So, but guess what? Where there is that, the enemy opposes it. And there can be real warfare over relationships. We see it in marriage. I'm married. I never experienced that kind of warfare. I got married, and I was like, there's war over me and my husband being in unity. Why? Because what happens when we're in unity? So it's, there's warfare over, I have a lot of really, like even in my relationships that I've had in my life, the ones that are so important, oftentimes there's warfare against them because of what God wants to do with them. We see this dynamic in teams and bases and churches, all of this. So where two or more are gathered, he's in the midst of them. And if one of us can put a thousand to fly, like, why does he resist unity? Because that's where the kingdom advances. When people come together in unity, he is amongst them. And then the enemy is pushed back and things go forward. So it's so, I've seen so many amazing things that could have happened, but because of disunity, they didn't because people wouldn't pay the price to fight through it. And especially around the apostolic and the prophetic. If the apostolic and prophetic work together in in this place, what can be done is, is just absolutely amazing. And, of course, all the gifts are a part of this. Please know that when I'm saying this, I'm not leaving anyone out, but I'm specifically talking about these things. And no matter where you find yourself and what gifting, it's still important that you know about this so that you can help the community. Yeah. So in the beginning, in the history of YWAM, we totally see this dynamic happening over and over again. And we've seen many moves of God that were birthed over the years and from different places that came out of these two gifts working together. And I personally believe there are some things that he'll only speak is when we're together in that way. That there's just some vision and some things that he's like, I'm not going to tell it to you and I'm not going to tell it to you. I'm not going to tell it to you. Come together. And I've been in a many prayer times where that was the case. I could not hear that word if I was home by myself. I didn't hear it until I was in the room with the apostolic, and they were in the room with me, and then we heard, they heard, there was some, there was an anointing and a presence and an affirmation and a confirmation that came, and some of the greatest things that we've seen in, the, in our mission have come from those moments that we were together. Uh, Lauren would tell me that, I think it was here even, maybe here in England, I'm not sure, but some of them in the early days, the founders would fly to each other's locations to pray through the night to get on the plane to go back the next morning because they knew when they were together what would happen. And we complain if the prayer meeting goes over a little bit. 
God will give leaders vision and strategy that is from him, but then he'll often speak to the prophetic ones about the ways of God and the process of God in the midst of the journey. So here's what I have found, is the vision comes, here we go. But then along the way, oftentimes the Lord will speak to the prophetic, and sometimes intercessors, all that, that slow us down for a minute to understand the character and nature and what is God doing. Because he's not always interested in getting to the destination. He's often interested in our heart and the process that we walk out to get to that destination. So there's so many times where we'll hit obstacles, we'll hit walls, we'll hit things that cause us then to come to the Lord. And that brings humility and dependency on God. So though the vision comes, the revelation comes, but then a lot of times the prophetic's job is to come in and keep us aligned to what God is saying, but not just to what he's saying, but who he is. He'll speak to the prophetic in ways that keep that vision aligned to our vision and our values. He'll often speak to the prophetic warnings when things start to get off track from the word of the Lord and the character and nature of God. The true prophetic, not disgruntled prophetic. Do you know what I'm saying? People that are really actually hearing from the Lord. So there's so many times where it's like vision's going, and I'm in that role often of the prophetic. So it's like, yes, 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 and then I see the red flag that comes, and I'm like, "Uh uh-oh. Now here's the thing is I hate bringing the red flag. Why? Because it rains on their parade. Like the last thing they want to hear, they just want to hear all systems go, run, run, run. And I'm like, wait, wait, got something here. Here's what we have to avoid, or here's where we're going to slow down, and we have to keep this part. You know, there's different things that strategy will come often through the prophetic voices that keep us aligned to the heart of the Lord in the process of running after God. And the prophetic will often become aware of areas of warfare opposing that vision. So to help us know how to pray, to help us avoid pitfalls that are along the way, to keep people healthy along the way. And God will speak strategy to prophetic people on how to move forward in that place of, of spiritual warfare, in that pra- place of breakthrough. Because how many times do we get a vision and then all hell breaks loose? You're like, I thought I heard from God. How do we navigate this? Well, that's where when we come together and we're willing to listen and not be like, I don't want to hear this. I just want to hear all the things that are right. But when we have this moment, then God speaks and we see major breakthroughs in our lives. You guys think about even just in your own personal life. How many times on the journey of walking something out, God does a work in you? And I just think of that on a, on a whole campus level or a whole church level or a whole, like, he allows these things to happen because he's more committed to our hearts than he is getting to that destination. He may speak to the prophetic acts of faith or divine appointments. So a lot of times, like, we hear the word of the Lord, and then in a place of prayer, in a place of seeking God, it's like, well, how do we get to that nation? How do we take that that sphere? How do we do this? And when we're working together, a lot of times, like, hey, I see that there's going to be a person that you're meant to meet in this city, at this location, and God will begin to speak this supernatural divine strategy of that will help us get to where we need to go. And words will come, and if we're not paying attention to it, we're just plowing, and we miss the very steps that he wants us to take to get there. So the apostolic just sees the vision, but oftentimes the prophetic sees the steps and how to walk that vision out that are very strategic and important to the plan of the Lord. Sometimes God speaks to prophetic ones to give them, they gives them encounters that have to be submitted to the apostolic leaders to be weighed and tested. And I'm going to, again, just kind of slow down for a minute here, is that I wish God just always talked plainly. I wish he did. It's so hard sometimes to walk out things that you're like, what does this mean? Like, this is crazy. Like, I know it's God, but I have no idea. But it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, and it's the glory of kings to seek it out. There's something that makes us dependent on God in those processes. So God will often say things that have to be interpreted and weighed and tested over time to fully understand them. And a lot of times, guys, a lot of words of the Lord are so multifaceted that you understand them over years. And what you thought you knew five years ago, but if we're not constantly working together, we'll miss the opportunity to understand what God was saying. 
So can I share a little bit, just a little of my own experience in this? Because I can only speak from that. Uh, so if this, the student, I mean, you've probably all heard the story before, but it's one of my, it's an important part in my journey. Um, but with the whole circuit rider movement that came here and all of this, this is how it happened, is that Amy had a, I had a angelic visitation, a real one. Like, Angel showed up at my house, dressed in colonial clothing, talk about cryptic, like strangest, craziest encounter of my whole life. He spoke out loud. I have a, he has a messenger bag on, and he said the Lord was going to release his circuit riders, and he said where it was going to start in California. I mean, the whole thing gets, the, and I'm like, as a prophetic person, you, I'm excited that that happened, but I'm also terrified, and I'm also thinking, they're going to think I'm crazy. Like, there's, it's not fun for me to go to the apostolic leaders and be like, guess what happened to me last night? Like, some people might think that. I'm like, oh, no. Why couldn't he have just said it like this? Why don't I tell him? You know, all the things that come with it and the insecurities that arise. But I submitted that word to the leaders, and I submitted it to Lauren Darlene, but I also submitted it to Andy, who is my peer, but also leads to some, and a man named Brian Brent, who was more of a spiritual father, because this is the thing. I had no idea what to do with it. I had the encounter, but I had no idea what now. Why? The Lord wasn't going to tell me. He was going to tell them. So I go, here you go. Have fun, boys. Like, <laughs> and they're like, Amy, you know, I'm like, sorry, that's what happened. So together, with me involved, we sought the Lord for over a year. Like, we didn't get on the podcast the next day. We didn't use the word angel publicly. Why? Because it needed to be weighed and tested. That's a pretty major encounter. What, one of the greatest mistakes people do is they let it come right out of their mouth. And God can't trust you with secrets. Finally, you got something. You have something to say, so you go say it. It's one of the greatest mistakes you can make is just like we overshare all the time where we have to actually steward it and go, what are you saying? So a few of us knew about it. We're saying, God, obviously an angel showed up, and they trusted me because of my history with them. But they were like, no one thought I made it up. And I, sh I mean, if anyone thought I made it up, it must be me, not them, um, just because you're like, did that really happen? So I give it to them. But here's the thing. A whole movement was birthed out of this. But it wasn't birthed because Amy had an encounter. It was birthed because the apostolic built something out of the encounter that I had. If there wouldn't have been an Andy Bird and a Brian Brent and the others in my life that would have stayed an encounter and a movement would have never been birthed. Same with Fire and Fragrance in my world. And even I would think in some ways, even YWAM, if there wasn't those things in the beginning, I don't know that it would have went to the places that it went. So I believe with all of my heart that that movement would have stayed an encounter that we all put in a good journal and never did anything with had there not been the apostolic that one valued it, sought the Lord, weighed and tested it, is this really you, God? So the thing that's the sweet spot, and I understand that we are a transient culture a lot of times and people come and go. So I'm speaking a little bit more to the people that are know they're called long-term to places and they're a little, that are longer-term staff in this, is that the greatest place is that you have to build trust and you have to build relationship. And when I asked the founders about this, they said our greatest strength was our love and trust for one another. Even though we were very different and we disagreed on a lot of things, there was a, there was a true trust and a true relationship that that stuff could land on. Now, I know that not everyone has that, but it's the goal that we are meant to have. So even it's not like you can have a relationship without hanging out with somebody all the time, especially in our world. It, in some cases, like, we're not going to be best friends. Like, it doesn't work that way. I, like I said, I work closely with Andy, and we have spent time together. But reality is we actually don't, we don't hang out that often. We live in different places now. But, like, it's still we've worked together, but, but we're busy people, and we have all these things. So it's not like, let's have intentional time of getting to know. Not, neither one of us are really like that in our personality. Um, we're like, oh, we're both introverts, so peace out. But... Um, <laughs> But there's trust over going through hard things together, of navigating. There's trust is built outside of just this dynamic, right? So it takes time. And that's what you have. So what am I saying to Harpenden? I'm saying this takes time, but it takes real intentionality. And there's so much warfare against it. And being really honest, me and Andy used to fight like you wouldn't believe. 
okay? Not like fight, like yell and fight, but like we did not see things the same. And I remember I was so mad at him one time. He hurt my feelings so bad. And I'm like, all going through all the insecurities. He doesn't this, he doesn't that, and da -da -da -da, and all this, I'll never be able to be myself, and he doesn't, like all the stuff is going on in my mind. I heard the Lord say, Amy, you could leave. You, you justified why you want to go or whatever. You could go leave. He said, or you could stay and fight for this relationship, and, and it'll, it'll, you'll go on to do some amazing things. And even working with Lauren sometimes, even working with anyone I've ever worked with, there's these moments. Yeah, it would sure be easier in the moment for me to do this by myself. But then I'm like, but if I fight for this relationship because I know God ordained it, I'm meant to work or be in this location or be in this place, if I fight through this, what could happen? And that's what builds the greatest trust. It's when you fight for each other and to say, I refuse to listen to the enemy, and I'm coming to a place of actually having real conversation back and forth about what's happening that's the foundations that you really can begin to work with one another. And I know there are times that God will speak and give words to people that we don't have relationship with. I've given many, many, many words in my life to people that I don't have trust or relationship with, that I'm still meant to give those things, but the people that I've really built with are the ones that I have trust with. It's the people that God's called me to, my tribe, my, my uh, whatever leadership team I'm on. That is important to, to have that, to really establish what God wants to build. So, yes, it takes time. There also needs to be a real value for what each other carry. Now, a lot of times I see this as where one of our greatest hindrances is, is that we don't actually value what each other carry because we only value what we carry, whether you sometimes realize it or not. But we have to be so intentional to value it, to act genuinely value it, not in, not in word but in true action and heart to actually understand. So I've studied the apostolic people I work with. I, I've studied how they work, why they do what they do. I love them. Like, I have put so much effort to understanding how they're, why they're wired the way they are. More than I put in effort to understand how I'm wired, because I kind of already know, right? So it's like, I work with other giftings too. Why are, so I want to value it. I want to understand it. Because some of the lie of the enemy is they don't understand. Well, no, there's a level that they can't. But... Just because they can't understand it, because they can't experience it, doesn't mean that they don't value it. So for the prophetic ones, that usually means a good season of you faithfully bringing what the Lord is speaking and humbly submitting to leaders. Listen, I believe in the structure that I'm talking about. I submit to the apostolic leaders in my life. I, it's my safest place. I feel so much more free to give words because I know that I can come and submit things to them and not have to figure it all out on my own. Over time, if you continue to bring, for the prophetic ones, bring accurate, true, insightful, helpful revelation, you will build a reputation that you will be trusted. If you only bring bad news, that's not going to work. If you're the prophetic person that only sees what's wrong, then you will never be fully trusted because you have to be able to bring the solutions of the Lord, not just point out what's wrong. That's what makes somebody actually truly prophetic is they bring the heart and the solutions of the Lord. They don't just point out all the issues. So when I say humbly, this is what I mean. When we come and we bring things to one another, you have, I don't own the word. I had, the, I had the angelic visitation, okay? That's a pretty big one. It's not mine. It's God's, and I've given it to those that I feel like are meant to have it, and I'm still a part of that. But there has to be a place in me that I let go and not be attached to it in a way that causes me to be possessive, controlling, manipulative, and all of those things. And I see it over and over again. This is one of the dynamics that keeps people from actually having unity is because the prophetic ones won't actually submit and release and say, I trust this process, let God be God, and I'll help bring me in if you want, but here you go, and I release it for them to figure it out or bring me in if needed. Right? So here are the, some of the main, you know, me and talk, I'm talking to a base, but churches, ministry leaders, this is some of the common areas of pain that I hear. So if I'm talking to the apostolic leaders, this is what I do partly, guys. They go into places and help them work together. 
So when I'm sitting with apostolic leaders, this is what I hear. Or when I'm sitting with prophetic people, this is what I hear. The areas of pain or hindrances, from the prophetic ones, I hear this. We don't feel heard. We don't feel valued. We don't feel activated. We don't feel accepted. We don't feel like space is being made for us. That's the common things I hear in lots of places. From the apostolic leaders, they say, we feel like they're trying to control us. We feel manipulated by the prophetic revelation. We feel slowed down. They bring bad news, and I don't want to hear it. They are always finding and pointing out what's wrong. They are over-emotional and weird. <laughs> I'm like, I agree. Um, so these are often the things that I hear. And I'm like, okay. So if those are things, and I think it's pretty common, that how those are all areas of pain that are pretty consistent, we got to be aware of them so that we can go, okay, some of that is my problem, not theirs. It has nothing to do with them. It's my own insecurity, my own issues. It, they, they couldn't do it right, and I'd still feel that way because of me. So I have to be self-aware enough to know that stuff about my life, right? And so there is a place as that that I'm like, okay, I actually trust they want to hear. I have to get to that place where I trust they want to hear from me. I trust that I do have a voice. I trust that I do have a place. Even when I feel like I don't, I have to start to take steps towards coming together in that place of truth. And every prophetic person I know, highly prophetic person I know, every prophet I know has dealt with real rejection in their life. It's the assignment of the enemy. Why? Because if you get a prophetic person isolated long enough, they'll do damage. And what does rejection do? It pushes them into isolation. So it shuts them down. How a prophetic person thrives is actually in community and alongside the apostolic, even when I'm introverted. So at some point in every prophetic person's life, they experience real rejection and they have to walk through insecurity. I've never met anyone that prophetic that hasn't had to walk through this moment. And I believe they have to overcome that to be truly effective in what I'm talking about today. If we're highly insecure, if we're bitter, and we're walking in the spirit of rejection, and we're not overcoming, then what happens is we create mixture in everything that comes out of us because that revelation has to go through all those filters. So God speaks a pure word, but then I filter it through bitterness, rejection, pain, all of this stuff, and I'm not overcoming. What comes out of me has that sound in it. Now, you go to the leaders and you have that sound in you long enough, they can't, it just doesn't work anymore. Now, I have tried my hardest to have a pure flow in my life and not be tainted by those things. Have I been rejected? Yes. Have I been misunderstood? Oh, a lot. Have people thought I was all the things that you could have happen, I've had happen to me. But there is a way to walk through that and continually let Jesus meet you in that and him heal you so that you can keep a pure flow. I cannot help what happens to me, but I can help how I respond to it. So... Now that said, there has to be grace given to the prophetic in walking through those things, and they need to be discipled. So in other words, on the apostolic side, you got to know, hey, listen, they've been rejected, and I sure don't want to feed that. I want to do my best, but I'm also not going to overcompensate for the people that have rejected them. And we see that too. So I just got flown into a location to meet with an apostolic leader to ask me these questions. They're like, would you just come and meet with me just to talk about this? Because this apostolic leader doing some crazy stuff said, I'm so afraid that I might not value the prophetic. Teach me how. I'm like, who are you? You're amazing. But I was like, but here's the thing. I'm like, just because other people have done this wrong doesn't mean you have to overcompensate for them. Just do the best that you can to love them, but don't be like, oh, I know they've been rejected, so now I'm going to reach so far over here. That doesn't actually help them heal either. It's just continuing being a healthy culture. That, does this make sense? Am I? Okay. So there has to be grace given, though, for people's process. Now, as a lot of places, a lot of my most prophetic people are really young because we're YWAM. I called you through the mission. So there's a whole lot of maturing that needs to go, and I have to have tons of grace for the young prophetic ones in our midst, and I can't expect them to have instant maturity, nor can the apostolic leaders. I watch Lauren Cunningham receive words from children and make major decisions based on it. For real. He said they don't have a junior Holy Spirit. 
And actually, I trust sometimes the kids' words better than anybody else because <laughs> they're going to have more of a purity. <laughs> so everybody needs to be walked with and discipled in that. So it's part of the apostolic's job to actually disciple the prophetic and help those people be able to communicate and articulate, and they need feedback. Now, one of the greatest weaknesses of the apostolic is they don't give feedback. Why? Because they're just running so fast they never thought of it. So I'll submit major things, like, especially when I was working with Lauren. He would call me sometimes and be like, Amy, will you pray into this? Yes. He said, let me know if you hear anything. I tell him. He says, thanks, and I never hear a thing again. I'm like, was I right? Like, did that make sense? He didn't even occur to him to tell me any feedback. He just kept on going with the vision. Thank you very much. Here we go. And so I also had to be willing to do all of that without the expectation of somebody giving me any feedback. And I'm thankful when it did. In certain relationships, I can, for sure. But that's when I say I release it. And if I get the feedback, praise God. If I don't, I'm not like, oh, my gosh, they're rejecting me. And they didn't believe. I go, you can go through all the things, but you just can't go down that road. You just have to be like, I was obedient to the Lord. And I just trust that they'll receive it. And awesome. And if something was wrong, they'll tell me. And if they need to tell me what's right. But so many of us, like, we get so insecure if we are not told all of these things, and as prophetic people, we just can't operate that way or it will not work with the prophetic. They don't actually have that much time, a lot of them. Often prophetic people are high feelers, so when you hear from the Lord, they, they, when they, they also feel it too. Okay, So when I hear from God, I don't just hear it, I often experience it, or I feel the word. So when we're discerning something or aware of the spiritual warfare that's going on, oftentimes the prophetic people, especially the intercessors, they actually experience it too. They don't just hear it. They're going through something. So there's a lot of things that are happening inside of them. But what the prophetic people can mistake is the level of intensity of what I feel for urgency. So this is what happens is you feel so urgent because it was so intense. So then you communicate it to the leaders urgently. And then they're hit with this thing of this person says, right now we have to, uh, and it's like, but that rarely ever bears fruit. <laughs> because we have to come back to the Lord and truly like come into peace that passes our understanding. Because I've seen where I have done this so many times and I see it happen is it's hard for apostolic leaders to receive from prophetic people because of the level of emotion that they're communicating in. They can't see through it to even know what you're saying because you're so emotional over what you're experiencing. So I have actually had to learn to discipline my emotions so that I can communicate in a way that they can receive it. And that's not me shutting down who I am. There are times that my emotion truly is the Lord, and I have to communicate emotion because it's part of the word. But a lot of times I have to learn to discipline my emotions so that I can communicate in a way that they will understand what I am saying and not mistake the intensity of the word for the timing of the word so where I've seen it go wrong the most is over this and I'm like oh just because I experienced it so urgently doesn't actually mean the word is urgent I have to seek the Lord over the urgency and the timing does that make sense yeah. all right in doing that um what happens is when we communicate that way we put pressure on leaders and that's why apostolic leaders say hey I feel pressure because they're communicating in such an intense way. And then I've even heard them say, if I don't do what they say, then they think that I don't value God. Listen, you, I'll just say because of the role that I've been in, the amount of dreams that people send you of horrible things and all kinds, nobody has time to sift through all that stuff. Maybe we should make that someone's job, but it ain't going to be the apostolic leader because they'd just die if they had to do all that stuff, Right. I'm just being real. So half the stuff isn't a word of the Lord. It's just people submitting things. Awesome. They should keep doing it. But there is a place where that I, I have to, like, when I release it, I'm going to trust that they're going to do with it the right thing because they value the word of the Lord. And around here, I do believe that's true. Okay? There are places where people don't. But I think around here and most of our location, people do value it. So that's why they, once I give it, I can't put pressure on them to do it. And sometimes that's where the manipulation comes in. Well, I gave them a word that we need to prioritize prayer. And I don't see that happening. And so then you get this thing like, you're not obeying God. I told you. <laughs> and then they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, maybe they are. We just haven't got there yet. It's not as quick as you think it should be. Do you understand? Like, there's a place of here you go. I am submitting this to you. As you feel led, I trust your leadership in this. Bring me in if you need help. Like, 
That's how we have to walk it out. So we seek the Lord together on timing. And more often, if something goes wrong, again, it's not usually in the word. It's in our interpretation or our timing of the word. So the prophetic ones are meant to be, meant to feed the culture of the prophetic in hearing God's voice. More than even giving words, what my job is, is to equip the saints to be prophetic. It's to create a healthy culture for young ones to come up and have a safe place to exercise the gifts of God that are put in them. I know we're going, to, we're going a little over, but I'm almost done. Prophetic culture is 1 Corinthians 14, which is the role of the prophetic is to pursue love and all of this. 80% of every word shared in the community should leave people encouraged, comforted, and exhorted. 20% brings alignment and correction, but 80% should just be encouraging, comforting, and exhorting. The prophetic loses acceptance if it's always calling out sin and judgment. Of course, that's not our culture, but it's still sometimes there are times that that happens, that it truly is God, but the majority of what we should be seeing is that calling into encouragement, comfort, and exhorting. Um, and what that actually means to edify means to build up. My job is to build you up. Not all, I, I do align a lot. I have a reputation for alignment, but that's actually part of building you up. It's to bringing you back in, like not just me, but the prophetic, bringing us back into that alignment and doing what it is that we're supposed to be doing. A prophetic word of alignment can be a given in an edifying way, and we need to give a word in a way that the least mature in the room can get it. Even I had a hesitation today and even give it, talking about this because I know that there's trainees here that they're only a few weeks in their school, and some of this they're like, what are you talking about yet? Because we haven't gotten, but I'm like, I still got to say this. But if I was to give a word, I have to think about the least mature in the room, could they receive what I'm about to say? Would they understand it? We have to carry that mindset of how do I build up and to not get caught up in creating a cultural expression of the prophetic. What does that mean? Is that we have a few styles, right? We have a lot of cultural expressions that I don't really think need to be reproduced. They're learned styles instead of authentic people. We need to create an authentic prophetic culture that's not like, oh, this is what it looks like to get, that people get to be who God's created them to be and how they bring that word. And there's things that we learn that are good protocols and all of this. But we don't, do you understand when I say we don't want a, to create a cultural expression? In other words, it's like, why was everyone prophesied they sound like each other? Because we've all just learned to sound... God, I feel, uh, you know, those kinds of things could be cultural expressions um, or they get all spooky or something. Uh, obviously, don't get judgmental. Yes. Now, here's the last I'll say. This is, what the, this is what the apostolic needs to learn to do. They need to learn to honor discernment in the midst of realignment. So, so often when we're building, we're realigning all of this stuff is that we have to honor the process of discernment in that. And sometimes they have to be willing to slow down because it actually means you get to speed up later, because the prophetic can help avoid pitfalls that stop forward mission, but it often takes time to slow down and be able to do that. So there has to be this trust on the other side. It's like this is not going to ultimately stop me from moving forward with vision. I'm slowing down for a minute so that we can actually keep this pace in the future. They have to move from the fear of bad news to pull on the prophetic. So what happens I see where the apostolic doesn't want to pull on the prophetic is because they're afraid they're going to get bad news of what they might hear. There has to be a value inside of that apostolic leader to want to know what God is speaking and to pull in the prophetic. So those in the room that are not necessarily, you wouldn't say you're apostolic, but you're a leader. And you lead different things and you have prophetic ones amongst you. That applies to you too. So you're like, I don't even want to engage these guys because I don't even know what they're about to say. And this is uncomfortable and I don't know what. To, so you have to be like, I have a value for this and I'm going to pull on it. I'm going to trust God to help us navigate what it is we're hearing together. And we need to learn to apply a profound encounters that people have sometimes and go, how, Lord, teach us how. Like, imagine Andy and Brian learning how to apply an angelic visitation of a guy that showed up to my house in colonial clothing and gave this word about circuit riders crisscrossing America into Europe. Into the, like, they had to learn how to weigh and test that and apply it instead of going, huh, that's cool. Like, they, they actually had to go, like, what does that mean then? So they studied circuit rider history. They studied all kinds of different things to go, how do, we, how do we then apply it? What is God saying this? Oh, he's saying he's raising up a new breed of fiery-eyed revivalists that preach the simple gospel of Jesus. That's what they came up with. He didn't, the angel didn't say, 
a new breed of, he didn't use any of those, that language of preachers of the simple gospel. He said circuit riders, and because of that, they went and studied it, and out of that, God began to speak of what this was likened to. So you had, there has to be a place of going, what does this mean, and how do I apply this? Um, and know that you're going to have to die to knowing all the details in the beginning. Like, I can't tell you. They're like, well, I'll call up one of them and be like, hey, this and this and this happened. They're like, what am I supposed to do? I'm like, I don't know. Well, what, like, what does it mean? I'm like, I can't tell you that either, other than I know that it's God, so we have to seek God to find out what does this mean and what is he saying in it and how do we respond to it. It takes a team to be able to do that. And giving way to directional words, and but allow the concrete to stay wet. So often we're going to build it and let's go, but in places, it's like the concrete has to stay wet so that we can still pivot and hear the Lord's voice in the process of building. All right. And this is the thing. A prophetic, the prophetic is not a one and done thing. It's a way of life. Oh, got my word. Talk to you in a few years. Uh, it has not to really work together. It's a continual process and a continual of walking it out. If visionary leaders don't work with the prophetic, they run the risk of not sustaining our values. They'll grow weary and eventually give up. They can lose your pathway. They'll become visionary machines and people will get hurt. They'll move ahead of God. And the prophetic keeps us out of presumption. Presumption is thinking we know what God is saying without actually asking it. So when it comes to the prophetic in giving and submitting words that we've talked about, it, this, it's, that's the process that I've done my whole life. And I'm so thankful for it. I really am. And I would never, ever want those guys to do what I said because I had a word. I, the reason I give them words is because I know they'll weigh and test it and they won't just do what I say. I, I never wanted to be put in the place as a prophetic person as the voice of God. I am not. I'm a voice. They hear God's voice. I would never want to create a culture where we do whatever the prophet says that leads to cults. And I would never want that pressure or that responsibility. And no one should want that. But also going, hey, this is a team and we work in team and this is how God designed it to work. We should never, ever control people with our words. And that's just, it's so important that we actually check our hearts. So when anything starts to rise up in our hearts that's negative, that we're so quick to go, what is this and why is it coming up? Right? And then you fight for the truth. I'm telling you, the enemy hates it. And now that I'm talking about it, and you guys are going after this, there is an opposition against it. Like, it's just the nature. The enemy's not that creative. He keeps playing the same game, okay? So it's like, I know this. I've walked through it many a times. I will continue to walk through it. I will continually be misunderstood. But I've kind of accepted that fact. But not in a poor Amy, you're misunderstood. But more of like, hey, that's going to happen. But I'm going to fight for connection and relationship with this person, even when I'm misunderstood, so that we begin to understand each other. All right. Why don't the worship guys actually jump back up, if you don't mind? I'm not going to necessarily just, I don't know. Are we all right? Okay. Plus, the worship was so good that I was like, oh, maybe I'll just make up a ministry time just so they'll play some more, but. <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't think I'll have a minute. Oh, that was nice. Um, but this is what I really want to do. I want to pray for this community. Here's, I'm, I'm going to even get wilder on you. I don't just think this is just for YOM. I also think that God's doing something in the UK right now. And there's so much history that's really good. And there's a whole bunch of things that have been lost that I believe that God is reviving again. And I've had a sense for a while um, that something is happening in this region, but it's only increasing and even in our, con like, okay, I'm in the send world. I didn't get to come to the one that they just did. But they, our team was shocked by the level of hunger. And they said, we were not expecting this. And I've just happened to be reading a couple books, even that have to do with some history here and things like that, where it's kind of, um, here, we're in a moment right now that we could lose something because of other people's really bad examples. So it's like, because of a whole bunch of other people's failures or other people's pain or other things that we can be like, hey, that's too messy. I'm not going down that road. It's too dangerous. It's not dangerous. The prophetic is, it can be, 
But that's where I'm like, I think God is raising up another generation that's going to walk in a level of holiness and purity and unity What that I think it's not just for the older generation that has walked in this stuff, but it's like, how are we going to model this for the next generation? What are they going to see? Are they going to see us fight for relationships? Are they going to see us... Uh, are they going to see us leaning into one another? Are they going to just see an apostolic leader that's just plowing and all of this and not fathering and not paying attention to all the things that they should? Are they going to see a prophetic manipulative leader that's, you know, I hope not. I hope they go, man, when those two gifts come together, movements are made. And I want to be a part of a movement. I want to be on that team. I want to I want to model these things. I feel like God is giving an invitation in the body of Christ to step into a new wineskin for the next generation of what he wants to do right now. So in my world, I, I am very aware of a lot of the dysfunction of the prophetic movement and it's so grievous to me. What could it actually, the temptation could come and it has come. Like, I'm like, I don't even want to be associated with it. There's moments that I feel that way. There's moments that I feel like I don't, you know, like it's embarrassing. It's not my mistake, but because I am associated with like, oh, these are what the prophetic ones are like or whatever, that I can actually shut down a part of me out of fear of them thinking that's going to be me. And I'm like, so sometimes I'm like, I'm almost afraid to do something. I, I have to fight it so that I won't be put in that. I, won't, I don't want someone to think I'm like that, and I don't. But at the same time, I'm like, well, we can't lose all the ground that we've taken over all of these years because of some people's bad choices and mistakes. I think we can't throw, as we say, a saying, we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? There's a place of going, hey, no, we actually have to dig in for the healthy culture so that we don't reproduce some of these things. It's not that we shut this thing down. So, yeah, it's messy. But it will never not be. You're talking about real people and real gifts and real movements. And I've never been in a part of a movement and I've never seen a clean birth. They're messy. They're wild. It's real. So I've now been a part of probably four or five movements that have been a part of birthing. And they all were painful. And they all were hard. And they were all messy. And they were all worth it. Every one of them. And thankfully, I've gotten the great honor of working with very humble people that actually had real value for the prophetic, real apostolic fathers and men in my situation that were good fathers and good men um, and so I've had that honor but I know of a lot of that's not but I just want to rip the fear out of the room in the name of Jesus and just say hey guys this is where God is leading us and this is where he's leading us as a mission and I can actually tell you that is that I believe that there is an increase and a resurgence of the apostolic and the prophetic and youth with a mission that's going to lead us forward into the future and that God is going to begin to highlight and anoint those with those giftings and all the other giftings for sure but I'm just talking about this tonight and that there's a place of an invitation to go I'm not going to give in to fear I'm not going to hide myself in a hole because I'm afraid I'm going to be misunderstood, afraid of not being heard, afraid of this. And on the other side, I'm not afraid of being controlled. I'm not going to be afraid of the mess and all of these things. But we're like, I want this because God wants this. And I can confidently say that I believe God wants this. And there's so much to be done that I believe that will come when we come together in unity. And again, it doesn't not about the apostle and the prophet. It's about leaders and intercessors. It's about leaders and young prophetic people. It's about all of it, right? And I just think right now, there's definitely a decrease in the prophetic that I've seen. And I think God wants to switch that, but we have to make room. And we have to make room for immaturity. We have to make room for all kinds of things that he wants to do, but it will be worth it. And I know as a YOM leader, I want this to be the safest place God could send prophetic people that they would be stewarded, they would be accepted, that they would, but they wouldn't be put on a pedestal or put in a place that would be unhealthy. And I'm so thankful for our inheritance that we have. And when Lauren Cunningham passed away, you realize this, is we have a founder that never once was associated with scandal. Never once. There's not many movements that can say that. There's not many movements that can say that their founder ended as well as Lauren did. 
and it hit us so hard. Just like, what are we gonna do with this inheritance? Let's run, but let's run together. So Holy Spirit, I just thank you. If you, now listen, I'm gonna ask you to be really brave. I'm not asking you if you're an apostle. I'm not asking you if you're a prophet, but I'm asking you if you think, I know I'm called to be a visionary leader and some of these descriptions of the apostolic that she talked about, I know are on my life. And if you're like, I know I got prophetic gifts of the Lord, I'm not saying you're a prophet, but I'm saying you know that that's part of who you are. I want you to stand up. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for the ones in this room that are young apostolic leaders that are a part of one of the greatest apostolic missions. Lord, this is our inheritance. You've called many apostolic leaders to this mission with many personality types, with many types of vision, God. But Lord, I ask them for a grace to come on these leaders. Lord, a grace, Lord, to bring in the prophetic around them, to have a value, God, for your voice and other people. Lord, I thank you that they are so multifaceted but Lord, I pray for fathers and mothers over them. Lord, they would be the ones that wouldn't become a visionary machine, but that would stop and hear a word from a child, that would stop and pull in, Lord, those that hear your voice in this way. Lord, I pray for a fathering and a mothering anointing on their life. Lord, that you would increase the vision, but you would increase the value. Thank you, Father. And Lord, for all the prophetic ones in this room, God. Lord, I pray for the fear to come off of them in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for healing for their insecurities and their fear. Lord, that you would meet them, God, and you would rip out the bitter root in Jesus' name. Lord, they would be teachable, that they would be humble. Lord, that they would be loving. Lord, that they would be activated, God, to be voices that speak the solutions of heaven. Lord, voices that hear your, your word. Lord, communicators and teachers of the prophetic God. Lord, I pray for that activation. And Lord, I pray for those that are sitting, that are around them, that they could come around these gifts. Lord, not in jealousy and not in envy and not in any of those things, but championing one another. And I thank you for every gift that's in the room. Lord, I thank you for the gift of helps in this room and administrators, God. I thank you, Lord, for the evangelists and the teachers and the pastors. And we need every single one to make this work. But tonight, God, I pray with the authority that you've placed on my life, an activation of these two gifts coming together. Lord, that it would be said out of the UK, that it would be said out of YOM Harpenden, that something began to happen when these gifts came together. There were movements that were birthed. There were a sign God, they begin to hear strategies for nations. Lord, they begin to hear strategies for this nation. Holy Spirit, let it be. Give them ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart that understands. Lord, I pray for the softness of heart, the softness of heart, Lord, to be tender towards each other and tender towards your voice. Holy Spirit, you're the teacher. Come and teach them where sometimes there's no roadmap, but you're a good teacher. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Let's just end in a moment of worship.